pertaining to being in the room where it happens. It makes me, this extrovert, uh, very joyous to be in the room with people. But then we also have a system that is allowing people that have chosen to stay at home and watch um, to participate. So we want to make sure that we're allowing that system to get up to speed. So. Good afternoon. Hello, for those of you not familiar with me, my name is Jasmine Brett Stringer Moore, and I am one of the Human Rights and Relations Commissioners. Uh, and I am your moderator for today's discussion on bias and hate in our community. Edina is a city with much to offer, great schools, beautiful parks, vibrant neighborhoods, and great neighbors. I know I had a great time with some of my neighbors last night at the Lizzo concert. <laughs> we had so much fun. And we even ate at one of the great restaurants in our community before heading down the Treasure Island. But unfortunately, many members of our community are experiencing bias and hate. Those who place of origin, first language, gender identity, sexual orientation, and religious faiths are not those of the majority of others in the community. The HRRC has planned this event to hear from experts and leaders about the impacts of bias and hate, to hear directly from those in our community about their personal and lived experience with bias and hate to hear from our public officials about what our local and state governments are doing to combat and counter bias and hate. And at the end of the event, we hope you will leave with a blueprint for action, because really that's what it's about. How can we take action to improve our community? You know, today is the day after we honored our, our fallen um, countrymen marking the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And I was watching the ceremony yesterday morning. I have a dear friend who is a survivor. One of my oldest childhood friends is a survivor. Um, and I was listening to all the names being called. And if anybody watched yesterday, you know that they had um, family members participating in reading the names. And then if someone were reading a name and they, were share, they would share a little something about their family member that lost their life on that horrific day. And one of the women said that, yes, 9-11, was awful, but the day after 9-11, 9, or September 12th, was amazing because we were unified as Americans. And when we are unified, there's nothing we can't accomplish. So thank you for being a part of this event to unify our community. Before we begin, we would like to recognize the public officials who are here with us. Several will be speaking in the last part of the event, but most are here today to simply listen, but we want to acknowledge and welcome them. We have Minnesota State Senator Melissa Franzen, Minnesota State Representative Heather Elderson. We have Edina City Council members Ron Anderson and Carolyn Jackson. We also have Edina, uh, Edina Public School Superintendent Dr. Stacy Stanley and Edina School Board member Erica Allenberg. Thank you so much for joining us. Our first speaker this afternoon is Ankita Dika. PhD, Associate Professor of Social Work and Masters of Social Work Program Director at Augsburg University. Dr. Dika focuses her research on health disparities, gender and poverty in developing countries and marginalized populations. Her most recent research was on understanding the impact of shame culture on Muslim Americans experiencing substance abuse. Dr. Dika's teachings is centered on anti-racist and anti-oppressive approaches. Dr. Dika.
Thank you, Jasmine, for the introductions. Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, League of Women Voters, Idaina chapter for organizing this event. My goal today would be to outline the issues that Asian Americans in our communities as well as in the United States face and to particularly bring home what might be helpful for us as a community to think through as we think about interventions. So in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and the national reckoning for racial justice, there has also been an upsurge of violence against Asian Americans. However, the reticent national attention to the violence experienced by Asian Americans, whether it is in the attacks in Chinatowns, subways, or the murders in Atlanta, underscores how the U.S. has not fully owned the legacy of exclusionary anti-Asian practices. According to Stop AAPI Hate, an organization that has been tracking anti-Asian hate crimes, there has been at least 9,000 81, the word is reported incidents of anti-Asian violence between March 2020 and June 2021. It is no coincidence that this violence escalated since the use of the term China virus by President Trump following the pandemic. In order to understand the context of anti-Asian violence, it is important to explore the model minority myth which was created during the civil rights era to fracture the coalitions between Asian Americans and other communities of color. This stereotype continues to be perpetuated to undermine the unique challenges of our communities, including our experience of racism and prejudice. It also continues to pit us as groups of good minorities and bad minorities while centering whiteness as the norm. This stereotype also conveniently keeps the conversation of Asian American, American violence tucked away from the public consciousness. This universalizing of our experience through this stereotype presents us as one monolithic group and undermines the history of racism and xenophobia directed at different Asian American groups at different points of history. It also systematically veils the ongoing inequities our communities face. Asian Americans are a very diverse group of people representing many different countries of origin, pathways of migration and immigration. In fact, there are more than 40 countries represented in that monolithic imagination of Asian Americans. Uh, I'm personally very sensitive to the fact that as Asian Americans, we are invisible in the conversation on racism and colonialism. As long, and we are only brought in when the narrative suits white interests, such as characterizing us as model minority. Most recently, white folks have weaponized the etymological evolution of the acronym BIPOC, to exclude Asian Americans from conversations on racism. Author Kathy Park Hong of the seminal book, if you haven't read it, you should, Minor Feelings and Asian American uh, Reckoning, uh, writes that we are invisible, so our issues are invisible. Her book helps the reader unpack how as Asian Americans we struggle to frame our experiences within the existing molds of oppression and how that influences our inability to name the oppressions we face on a daily basis. I am fully cognizant that the larger Asian American community has its own serious struggles with anti-blackness, but it is important to acknowledge that the racial hierarchies that we see in this country, including the anti-blackness uh, that is a feature of our Asian American uh, communities, are a product of colonialism and white supremacy. We have to name things as they are. Our communities have to work to do or have work to do to challenge the lingering anti-blackness and also get a way out of our complicity in seeking white proximity to gain marginal privileges. In a recent article in the Time magazine titled A History of Exclusion, of Erasure and of Invisibility, Why the Asian American Story is Missing from Many U.S. Classrooms, the author Olivia B. Waxman argues that the violence in the last year against Asian Americans highlights the history of exclusion, erasure, and invisibility. We need to be seen and heard. Small acknowledgments from the city of Edina, 
uh, city council, as well as our representatives and senators and our school districts could actually go a long way in sending this strong message that anti-Asian hate crimes are not acceptable. Uh, this support, even if symbolic, lifts up the concerns, anxieties, and the struggles that we face and that our students face in the classroom. It is important to center the experiences of Asian American students in the classroom. More importantly, when we acknowledge it, we see it and we hear it. And we also lift up the fact that we matter, that Asian Americans matter. Thank you all for facilitating this conversation. I hope I was under six minutes, but this is a much longer conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dika, for that important talk. And I, I didn't even think about how Asian Americans are left out of the conversation with the acronym BIPOC, which there are a lot of debates on if it should be used, who it relates to. So that was a very relatable um, comment. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear from James Darvell, Policy and Organizing Director for Outfront Minnesota. Mr. Darvell has devoted his career to building progressive communities and advocating for reproductive justice and queer liberation. As LGP, LGBTQ plus voter outreach manager for Outfront, he worked in 2020 with queer communities and communities of color to register voters throughout the state of Minnesota. Previously for Planned Parenthood, North Central States, he oversaw all volunteer programs across five states. Thank you. Hi, everyone. That made me sound a lot cooler than I think I actually am. Thank you for that introduction so much. Um, hi, um, my name is James Darville. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the political director for Outfront Minnesota. I wanna try really hard not to move around. I used to be a youth pastor, so I'm really used to stepping side to side, but we'll stay focused. Um, Outfront Minnesota has been around since 1987. Um, we started as a queer liberation group focused on um, gay rights and lesbian rights. And then as um, communities have expanded and as we have expanded our look on queer issues, have then started to look at our trans brothers and sisters and look at our non-binary brothers and sisters um, and friends and families. And so we started really working towards um, liberation doing um, anti-discrimination acts. The Anti-Discrimination Act in Minnesota was one of the most progressive anti-discrimination acts. Um, in the 90s. I think it was one of the first ones that included trans folks in the United States, which is incredibly important and incredibly powerful for the 90s. Um, and then we went into working for the anti-bullying campaign. We also worked on marriage equality in 2013, passing it here in Minnesota before it was passed in 2015 nationwide, which was an incredible win. Um, and now we kind of look at where we are now. Um, Outfront Minnesota has several different arms and entities, I work in policy. We also have education, which works in schools. And we also have, um, we also have our anti-violence program, which works to help queer individuals leave really stressful situations and help them navigate through court systems and get any kind of assistance that they may need. So as we look at it now, what are the issues that queer people are experiencing in Minnesota, in Edina, in Minneapolis, in Red Wing, in Duluth, one of the things that we're experiencing right now is the practice, the discredited practice of conversion therapy. Um, for those who don't know conversion therapy um, and what it looks like, it, is, it looks like talk therapy and it is to essentially tell queer folks and um, gender nonconforming folks or trans individuals that who they are integrally is not true and not okay, which we know through science, it is okay. How we are born, how we present ourselves is scientifically accurate and we are able to exist in America as free citizens who pay taxes and wanna go to school and want jobs and wanna just like experience life like anyone else. So, oh, excuse me. So one of the things we're working on currently is banning conversion therapy in the legislature. It's a fight that we have had for many years. Um, and has been continuously blocked. 
we know that youth who experience conversion therapy are three times more likely to experience suicide ideations, um, which is an incredibly high number. Um, we know that it increases depression within youth. So that's why we named that bill the Mental Health Protections, because it is protecting the mental health of youth within the state of Minnesota. Recently in July, we were able to pass a, um, an executive order with Governor Walls that would ban any state dollars going to conversion therapy and look into the practice further in the state of Minnesota, which a lot of folks didn't even know was still legal happening or that the state was paying for it, and it was, and now it is not. But it is still able to be practiced in the majority of the state. We do know there are, other, there are cities who have passed conversion therapy bans, including Minneapolis, St. Paul, Red Wing, Duluth, Robbinsdale, and hopefully soon we can expand that further. But looking into 2022, we also hope just to pass the legislation to ban it outright for any youth under the age of 30, or 18 and any vulnerable adult. Another thing that we work on is um, the health and wellness of our, tra our trans sisters and brothers and trans individuals in Minnesota. Um, the average life expectancy of a trans woman is 35 in the United States. That is incredibly young and they experience a high level of violence. They also experience a high level of discrimination within their workplaces and within the state. So that's something that we work towards. And a way that we do that is one, to have these conversations where folks as yourself come together, hear me talk and babble, but also talk with each other and meet community members and know that trans individuals are also here because they want to work and they want to experience life as well. And they deserve that and we deserve to give that to them. And so doing that means that we are gonna to work towards liberation together. So that is something that we are working on. Um, and then another thing that we wanna make sure is that we create safe spaces within our schools for our queer youth. And what that looks like is having GSAs. What that looks like is having teachers go through sensitivity training. What that looks like is making sure that school systems allow students to go by the pronouns that they choose which we know is a right of students within the state of Minnesota, does not mean that every school system follows that law, but we want to make sure that we are expanding education on LGBTQ issues because LGBTQ issues overlap with a lot of other issues. They overlap with BIPOC issues. They overlap with indigenous issues. They overlap with reproductive issues. They overlap with environmental issues because we as queer people exist in all of those spaces and all of those things affect us. Um, so I wanna thank you for your time. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to Outfront. We have a wonderful staff who are here and who can connect you with any resources or services that you may need. Again, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, James Darville, for that. I, I love the concept of liberation together and the need for safe spaces. And I'm gonna take that a little forward and think about how can I be a safe person for the LGBTQ plus community and, and, and personalize it in my approach. I think I had a flashback um, to dancing at the Lizzo concert last night and I was remiss in acknowledging our mayor, James Hovland, and Minnesota State Representative Steve Elkins in my opening remarks. If you gentlemen would please wave so that the audience may know that you are present. Please charge it <clears throat> to the head and not, and not the heart. We will now hear from Mr. Steve Unix, JD, Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota in the Dakota. Steve um, was very nice to participate um, in our Days of Remembrance event uh, two months ago, so thank you for being here with us once again today, Steve. Steve, who was with us this afternoon in person, uh, has led the JCRC since November 2006 after serving first as Minnesota Assistant Attorney General and then as attorney in private practice. During his leadership, the JCRC has been recognized locally and by the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office for its work to build relationships, educate, advocate, and safeguard our community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Stringer-Moore. And as I 
reference for the Days of Remembrance, now twice in two months. It's quite an honor for the St. Louis Park guy to have a, a session here in the Edina City Council Chamber, so thank you very much. And it's wonderful to see a completely full City Council Chambers. So that's terrific. Thank you everybody for participating today and thank you for everybody participating virtually. I have a lot of thank yous because the City of Edina and so many good folks coming together at this time are worthy of this important recognition. Uh, thank you to Mamie Siegel, it's Mamie Siegel and Michael Epstein of the Edina Human Rights Relations and Commission. Uh, to Senator Franzen, we're grateful for your good health, Representative Edelson, uh, Representative Elkins, and Judy to Mayor Hovland, thank you very much. And you know, the city has worked so hard, whether it's through the Human Rights Commission or through its acts in general, uh, to create equity, uh, to create justice, perpetuate freedom, that it's something that all Minnesota cities should replicate. So thank you very much. Sort of a special thank you to Council Member Bennett, who I understand was a veteran of the JCRC 4-H program and that wonderful idea existed from Becker, Minnesota, and now you're here in Edina, so all good things there. And to my fellow speakers for today, Dr. Dika, Dr. Or Mr. Darville, from whom we've heard, Ms. Jennings, Ms. Ismail, Dr. Ellen Kennedy, and Superintendent Stanley. So thank you for your commitment. And I have to say this, my dear JCRC colleague, uh, Anthony Sussman is a graduate of Edina High School and lived many years in Edina, so all sorts of great Edina connections for the JCRC. For the minutes, the hours, the days in which we are living are very notable now. As the Vice Chair mentioned, the 20th anniversary yesterday of 9-11. It's the 10 days of reflection, contemplation, the New Year's for the Jewish community, and I say that we all should be inscribed in the Book of Life. Just last week, folks may know that the Hmong Cultural Center in St. Paul was desecrated, vandalized, just one day, just one day after the sign was, to was posted there. And then people have seen that at Bethel Synagogue, my congregation, in St. Louis Park, and then the, Shemit, <coughs> the Chesed Shell Emmet Cemetery in St. Paul was desecrated over the last few days. You know, the names of those institutions in Hebrew, Bethel, House of God, Chesed Shell Emmet, Love and Kindness, and Truth, all help ground us in these days. And tomorrow, and tomorrow, and I'll speak briefly about this later, is the sentencing hearing for Michael Hari, who was convicted in the bombing of the Islamic Cultural Center, Dar el Farouk, in 2017. So you have all of these events sort of coming together at the same time. I want to start with this thesis statement that the American Jewish experience in 2021 in the United States is one of great acceptance, freedom, community partnership, and I can attest to you as the JCRC director of Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, and as I like to say, 225,000 square miles of paradise, that the opportunities for partnership, working together for a better community are seemingly endless. And that's such a wonderful reflection upon our community. So I want you to keep that in mind. Because at the same time, we're aware of the profound challenges of the spasms of anti-Semitism, sometimes violent, that we're seeing now, whether in word, the threat directed against Bethel Synagogue, or the heinous attacks against congregations and synagogues in Pittsburgh, Poway, Monsey, and throughout the country, or social media uh, during the escalation, unfortunately, in tensions between Israelis and Palestinians, the social media particularly directed against our young people. That said, what we are seeing now in the outpouring of community support, response of law enforcement, churches, local, state, and federal law enforcement, especially in my hometown of St. Louis Park, is remarkable. And those are all for the good, too. So we've got to occupy our brain. Our brain should occupy both thoughts simultaneously. Please keep that front in mind. Talking about tomorrow and the sentencing of the defendant in the bombing of the Islamic Center, because after all, this is about stopping the hate, right? And there's probably no more uh, awful act of hatred committed against the house of worship in Minnesota than the bombing of the Islamic Center and Mosque in 2017. The JCRC 
helped to organize with the Japanese American community, Christian community, Jewish community, African American community, a letter to the court, a submission to the court, arguing for an upward departure from the sentencing, a greater sentence than normal, given the terror of the crime. And why do we do that? Because when you attack a house of worship, when you attack a house of worship, you mean to intimidate, you mean to intimidate a community, and it has ripples and reflections and reverberations throughout. You know, and that's why it's important that all communities are speaking together tomorrow at the sentencing of the defendant, Hari. I'll have a chance to speak for a couple of minutes, just like today, in the courtroom of Federal Judge Donovan Frank. But I'm looking out at this audience, and I feel as though I'm standing there for everybody making this argument to the federal court tomorrow, because if there's a way to stop the hate, that is it, in a way to mete out justice. Because I'm very proud of our federal law enforcement in connection with the Dar el Farouk bombing for thoroughly investigating the case, prosecuting the case, and earning a conviction of the defendant in that case. Can't imagine anything more important for the purposes of stopping the hate than successfully prosecuting a bomber of a mosque in Minnesota. So we should all be thankful for that. And in essence, as I stand here today, I see the fullness of the greatness of our country. Yes, we have difficulties. Nobody can deny that we have difficulties in the United States. Some of them have been beautifully reflected in the remarks so far and will be further contemplated over the course of the afternoon. But as an American Jew, I can attest to you, the opportunities in this country are remarkable and the opportunity yet again for us to come together in these city council chambers to work together to stop the hate is outstanding. But let's not end the sentence at stop the hate. Let's say stop the hate, help each other and build community. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you again, Vice Chair. Finger more. Thank you, Steve. I like that. Let's stop the hate, help each other, and build community. Thank you so much for that. Speaking next is Nicole Jennings. Nicole is a Edina resident and member of the anti-racism collective of Edina. Mrs. Jennings devotes her life to running two businesses, advocating for social justice and tending to her family. She hosts a podcast, Uncomfortable But Necessary Conversations, as a platform for discussions of social justice, racial equality, and the empowerment of undeserved and marginalized black and brown communities. Communities. Mrs. Nicole Jennings. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Um, it's interesting that you brought up the, uh, the podcast because I've actually been a lot uh, more invested in the community. Um, and taking a pause on that. But essentially, as Jasmine said, I'm Nicole Jennings, and I am here just to give my um, I guess, perspective. I, I don't have a, a large or a lengthy um, prerequisite of like PhD and all of the things. Nope, I'm black and I live in Edina. <laughs> so I can only speak to that. And outside of that, I think the most important thing is that Jasmine even brought up is that I am vested in my family, my children, four of them. And the reason why this conversation got started and was real for me is because of the simple fact that after the murder of George Floyd, my neighbor, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna get emotional, but my neighbor had a loss of, in her life, her, her husband, um, and she is white. And she took the time to ask how we were doing as a black family after losing her husband and I'd never had such a um, thoughtful thing done in seven or eight years of living in Edina. And it just spoke volumes to who she was um, as a person. And it showed me that someone in my neighborhood really cared. And that was huge. Uh, because that day, we had to have the opportunity to break down to my seven-year-old son. That 
a bad thing happened, but all people, we still treat like people. And he's seven. And then I had the same conversations with my three daughters. And because they're older, I was able to explain to them that the same concept that we told him, but we told them realistically that no matter what, they don't have to live life in fear and that they don't have to live life believing that they're less than. Thank you. Because they're not. No matter what they may see or hear. They deserve the world just like everyone else. And that as long as there was breath in my body, mommy was going to make sure that we could do everything we could. And so in that moment, um, it, I took a personal stance um, because I had gotten comfortable. I'd gotten comfortable in being able to afford the things that you have to be able to afford to live in Edina. I pay taxes that cost more than the many that have in my family for generations have ever seen in taxes. And I don't take that lightly. I'm grateful and I'm blessed. And with that, that means I give back because I wouldn't be here if there weren't people who went before me and laid down their lives for me to be here. And that's the only reason why I have the opportunity to stand before you is because of that privilege, which we all have. And I am grateful to those that invited me to be here as, as a member of the community um, to share because it's the privilege that I have to be a member of the community um, that I call home, that if I couldn't pay to be, I wouldn't be able to use my voice. And I just wanted this opportunity to say that essentially the conversations that are having, that are being going on in the community like this one and others, that's great, but conversation doesn't save lives. It's your action. And this is the first step and that's great, but it's about perspective. And until you become pro get a close proximity with a different perspective than your own, it's the only opportunity for you to see something different. Unless you've had a conversation with the, your young child about their lives potentially being on the line because of the color of their skin, you'll never understand that feeling. And I just wanna take this opportunity to tell you about the conversations that I've been a part of in the community. Some have been great, others have been challenging, and some that I have not even still to this day as I stand before you shook it off. It was that traumatizing and trigger impacting. Um, I'm grateful to have a husband uh, who, poor guy, he hears, he listens to me vent a lot on a lot of different things, but there are some things that just I can't let go of because of the simple fact I know that if I am not up here standing before you, standing for something, that I definitely will be lulled back to sleep and fall for anything, and that's not an option for me. Um, being raised by my great-grandmother, who was born in 1921, um, the year of Tulsa. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it. It's, it's there. Um, and so the impact of uh, the fight and the will and the wherewithal to overcome is just in my DNA. It's just who I am. And therefore, I know that I'm also standing before you letting you know that yes, we are in a very, we have always been in a very serious situation, but until it got to in your backyard is when it got real. It's always been real. 
Um, but the conversations need to continue and action plans need to be implemented for all. Um, yes, against hate, about making things equitable for all. Yes, all lives matter. I, but I, one thing I heard said before is that you state your problem, you name your problem. And as a black person, as I said to my kids, their lives matter. And if you're polarized by the concept of a sign, a shirt, of some that says Black Lives Matter, question that internally, take it in, understand the statement is not political, my skin does not vote, my body does, but if I'm murdered, can I? Do I have a voice and what is it to matter exactly? Because I've had to talk to that sentiment with my seven-year-old son and my other three daughters about what it means to matter and that they live in a community that might not be comprised of people that look like them, but that's okay, they, mat that you, they still matter, and that we are gonna fight to make it so that it becomes more of a diverse place, because in the conversations that have been somewhat triggering the concept of diversity, I'm from Michigan. Diversity is, looks different to me because of my proximity to what I believe it to be. And because I'm in your neighborhood and you can count on your single hand of the people that look like me in your neighborhood, if you have any, that's not diverse. It's not diverse. So again, I go back to the sentiment of the conversations that started in our neighborhood, continue to have those conversations. But outside of that, take those conversations and put them into an action plan. What happens next? I, we started a grassroots, and I can't say we started because it just kind of happened, the Anti-Racism Collective. And it's just that grassroots, uh, it probably hasn't even been around six months, but the concept of conversation, connections, um, making the community involved, get the community involved in conversation. Yes, it's hard, and if it's easy, you're not doing it right. It's not supposed to be. And we have come together as a collective of people, of differences, different backgrounds, ethnicities, all of the things that you can think of that makes us different, and we brought that together because it's possible. And with that comes different experiences and backgrounds and resources, and we put them together in a collective to have it be a resource to the community not just Edina, but it's the Edina Anti-Racism Collective, but to anyone who is interested in involving themselves in the conversation and connecting them to other resources that are out in the community, putting things into action. So if there is something that you wanna know how to do, which way to go, and things of that nature, join the conversation. We're on Facebook. Um, and I'm here in the community. Um, it's, it's interesting because one of the other conversations is, you know, wanting to get close and be have a, a bigger proximity to people of color. They're in your neighborhood if you open up your door and try something a little bit different. So again, thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you for having me. I know I was over six minutes, I'm so sorry. But thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nicole Jennings. We know that um, there is so much power in our stories and in conversation and in the strength of our lived experiences and how we move through life and, and what we overcome. So thank you for boldly and courageously sharing um, your family and your personal perspective. So, before we transition to the next part of our event, I have a question for you. How are you doing? Nicole mentioned that in her remarks. How are you doing? What a powerful phrase to begin to build community, to show that you care, to show that you are interested in being a good neighbor, a good citizen. How? are you doing? 
Next, the HRRC welcomes any member of the community to share their personal experiences with bias and hate. If you are watching this event, we invite you to send your comments to H as in Henry Lee, that's H L E E at Edina MN.gov. Heidi Lee, Race and Equity Coordinator for the City of Edina, will share your comments with the HRRC and city officials. Here at City Hall, we invite you to speak at the podium on the right. For, self, uh, for health and safety of all, we ask that you keep your mask on when speaking and do not touch the microphone because someone will have to come and wipe the microphone. I've been that person before with Lysol wipes. At the needs adjustment, one of our volunteers is here to help you. Finally, we ask that you please speak as clearly as you can, and please keep your comments to three minutes. So all those that wish to speak will have the opportunity. The light on the podium will change from green to red. Can we get an example? There you go. It's red. Uh, when your time is up. So our first speaker this afternoon is Fartoon Ismail. And Fartoon is also serves on the Edina Human Rights and Relations Commission. She founded and serves as the president of Somali American Women Action Center, or SAWAC. Sawak's mission is to empower, uplift, protect, and educate, educate immigrant, refugee women in Minnesota so that they can achieve and thrive economically and socially to build more resilient and healthy futures for themselves and their children. Fartoon, please join us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fertun Ismail. <clears throat> I am the executive director of Somali American Women Action Center, also known as SAWAC. I'm a mother, once a refugee, and a human rights activist. In the eyes of a young refugee girl, I have seen life in a different, different lenses, which advocate me to be or be the voice of a lot of underserved women that live in Minnesota. Today, I wanna, you know, I'm excited to share with you or talk about my experience and how I overcome, how I overcome hate in Minnesota or in my community. In 2017, I parked a jury parking lot with my amazing, beautiful daughter. She was three years old at that time. She, you know, all of a sudden, this guy parked right next to us. And my daughter was wearing a beautiful dress, which she was ready to rock the day, the day with her mom. And I was matching her. And she thought when this guy came out of the car and started stating us, the only thing she expected was she posed straight and confidently received a strong affirmation. She thought he's gonna say, you look beautiful. I love your dress. And all of a sudden, he came close to us, literally ear to ear, and he said some hateful words. And he said, go back to your country. My daughter leaned to me and she said, mommy, it's okay, we're gonna go home. In her mind, the only home she knows is the two bedroom that we lived in a, in a diner, the two bedroom apartment that we lived. She wasn't expecting that. She was expecting the same thing with her dad or any great human being, what he could have said. Three year old does not know any other home than a diner. I personally grew up half of my life in Minnesota and I personally does not know any other home than Minnesota. This place is our home for all of us and we shall never be moved. I wanna close with the words of Watson, Watson Shira, a British poet. She said, no one leaves home 
unless home becomes the mouth of a shark. And again today, no one leaves home and chooses to live in a refugee camp unless it's for survival. Today I urge you, all of you, that we should spread love and stop hating our community. It starts right here, all of us individual. Today I pre my dress presents the peace, solidarity, and love. And I, each of you, urge you to be that person every single day. Thank you so much for having me. If there's another member from the community that would like to speak, the podium is open. And please remember that we have three minutes and if you can make sure that you state your name so that we know who you are, we would appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rayan Abdul Khadr. I'm a student, I'm a student at Atlanta High School, I'm an activist, I'm an organizer, and I'm trying to make change in my community. <laughs> okay. Um, I was 10 when I started to realize that my identity would be, would be something that I would have to negate for the rest of my life. My identity cannot be hidden. It's written all over me in melanin and cloaked around my head in a cotton crinkle scarf. I previously went to school in, a Minneap in Minneapolis with a diverse population. I spoke Somali with my friends without fear of ridicule and wore my headscarf so proudly and so tightly that I faced an abrupt and scary change in fifth grade. I came to Edina and this was the first time I had ever walked into a classroom and I was the only person that looked like me. I introduced myself as Rayan, but was called Ryan for an entire year. A part of my identity already ripped away from me because it was too hard to say. I was constantly asked for an easier nickname and put in ESL despite English being my first language. I didn't understand what set me apart. Middle school came at me at full force, but I was so hopeful for a new year. I was instead met with criticisms about my headscarf. People did not approach me with curiosity, but with hatred. There were multiple times my hijab was ripped off with no proper repercussions. I was 11. I felt naked and disgusting. My own friends would comment on my hijab or make, skin, make jokes about my skin color, but the moment I spoke up for myself, I was the angry black girl. I was triggered. I was a ticking time bomb. I was a towel head. I was every single stereotype in the book. But there was this one specific experience I had when I was 14 in my eighth grade Spanish class. There was this one boy who would purposely push my buttons. He would touch my head and call me the N-word. He would whisper it in my ear and tell me I belong in the kitchen. This happened for multiple days in a row. I would tell him to stop, but when I informed staff about these racist incidents, nothing was done. When I again complained, I was the one removed from the class. I was made to feel alienated and confused as to why I was being punished for something I didn't play a part in. I felt like I was being punished for existing while being black. My faith in administration has absolutely been diminished. There's this stupid concept I often hear in Edina that you should just tell an adult you trust, and I did. I was met with punishment. There's a fundamental misunderstanding here in Edina that people don't see color or differences, but it is simply a lie. If you still think this way, it's time for a major reality check. This majority white city will never truly feel the way my blood boils or the way I worry about my identity as black, Muslim, and a woman. But the, le the least you can do is attempt to understand. This world is not so roses and rainbows for me. There is so much anguish and pain left boiling over inside of me. I go into school every year holding my breath feeling like, and I hate feeling like this. It's time for you to understand. Racism and hatred are learned. Do your part and teach your children better. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Brian, for your remarks. Uh, I believe we have someone next waiting to go. Again, please state your name and you have three minutes.
Hi, everyone. My name is Catalina Madrignan, and I'm speaking here on behalf of Irana High School's Chinese Language and Culture Club, as well as my co-presidents, Sarah Michelle and Lily Nygaard, who isn't here today, as well as our advisor, Ms. Wong, who is right over there in the audience. She's also the teacher for the middle and high school. So I'm up here today because at the end of last year, when the pandemic sent us all home, we decided as a club to design t-shirts for our members as well as any Chinese class students in the district. Not only did we think that this would be a great way to create a closer community among all the Chinese language students at Edina, but we also thought this would be the perfect opportunity to incorporate some fundraising to combat the rise of anti-Asian hate, which had only further escalated with the start of the pandemic. With the profit of over 50 t-shirts sold, we were able to successfully raise over $545 to a local organization named CAAL, or the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, which focuses on improving the community by connecting learning and acting together. Although this past year was highly successful for us, we are hoping to continue fostering similar fundraising opportunities for years to come, while also growing the Chinese program in our schools. If you have any questions or any ideas on how we can continue to do so, please check out our Instagram at EHS underscore Chinese Club and send us a DM. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Thank you. Please state your name and remember you have three minutes. Okay, I think I'm too tall for this. I can help you. Is that good? Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I am excited to have you all start this conversation in a diner right in our backyard. Am I supposed to, to touch this? Okay. Okay, so stopping the hate means a lot to me and to my family. When we first came to Edina, my wife was on her last trimester in her pregnancy. And I was a new expecting young person to be a father. I was excited about it. And when my wife delivered her baby, life wasn't easy for us and for my family. And one of the bright Sunday, someone chose violence and hate as they came in to my wife. She was a new mother breastfeeding her child. And in our culture, we incense our home with a perfume and stuff. So you know how mothers are obsessed with children and newborns, and she, like, she was like, I will open the door a little bit smaller. And a guy walked in the door, started recording her, naked without hijab, holding the baby and breastfeeding. And she started, she didn't know, she was weak. She was a new mother. She was still bleeding. Three days old baby the guy started recording. She was so frightened and scared. She called the neighbors, she yelled. And when neighbors came, they asked the guy, why did you record it, this woman in her own space? And he said, I thought the room was burning. And he said, I don't know what she's doing. Why is she opening her door? And to my question, all of you today is that, if you see a room burning, if you see someone's life in danger, will you save the mother or the baby, or will you just record it for the world to see, or for the world to blame the mother, or to blame the person? And again, when we talk about stopping the hate, it just starts right here in Minnesota, right here in our backyards in Edina. In the words of Amanda Gordon, there is always light if only we are brave enough to see, and we, if only we are brave enough to be it. Are we brave enough, Edina, to be that light of hope and a beacon of justice, love, solidarity, 
and stopping the hate. And as Dr. King will always say, hate cannot drive hate. Only love can do that. And again, I want to end with a, a beautiful uh, testimony over the weekend. Uh, our community lost a child, and it's right, right here, our neighbors who have shown the solidarity to be with us in the candlelight. I was amazed how people turned out. And thank you, Senator Melissa, Melissa Franzen. Thank you, Heather, and to the officials for coming and showing us support. A time of healing and a time when we need, we need each other. Of course, we are supposed to be each other. We are supposed to be for each other. And again, we are stronger together. Thank you all. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to share a community perspective or comment? Hi. Please state your name. My name is V Wenham. Um, I was here to support a friend today, so I don't have anything prepared, but the topic of this meeting I see is what are individuals experiencing right now? Um, I want to talk on behalf of Idana High Schools and the students at Idana High School. There's an Instagram account and a new organization called Idana Truth. If you look it up on Instagram and look on the website, there is hundreds of stories about students at Idana things they've experienced from misogyny, sexual assault, racism, transphobia, homophobia, and pretty much everything else you can think of. I find that this has been a very direct way to understand what the youth are experiencing in Edina. And not only is it about policy and about kind of what teachers are doing and what the administration is doing, but it goes a lot deeper than that. And I think that hitting these things at the root and not just you know, sending out an email blast or making a note to the community, it's extremely important to start this at home. And I think a lot of people have been saying this, but starting it in your home, in your community, and making sure you hit it at the root. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. I'll make sure to follow Edina Truth on Instagram. Is there anyone else from the community that would like to share? Well, I really enjoyed um, hearing from our fellow community members. Uh, it was interesting listening to Mr. Ismail's comment about um, his wife, and it, it reminded me of something that I experienced before moving to Edina. I remember I was very excited that we were buying a home in Edina and we were um, away on a, at, a, at a destination wedding in Mexico. And I, and I told this person who was of, of some notoriety in the Twin Cities, um, and the person was white, um, married to uh, a black woman similar to my family status. Uh, about this house and we were excited and he goes oh are you sure you want to move there let me tell you what happened to my wife and he told me a story of his wife being at the Edina Target right by South Dell and kissing her little girl and someone saying who are you to kiss that baby? I'm sure the parents don't want the nanny kissing the baby in her face. And I was just like, oh, I mean, it, and just listening to the story now, it just brought that up and how hurtful people can be with their words and their action. And listening to the community thoughts, I am reminded that words do matter that we need to be a safe space and a safe person for all of our community members, especially our youth and young adults and children, because they should be able to talk to an adult and get help and guidance and not be seen as a problem or a burden. We have to remember that Edina is home for all types 
of people. All types of people live here, and all types of people deserve to be treated with love, respect, and kindness, and grace. And then, I love this thought, who will save you? Who will save you? Will you save me, or will you just simply push the record button? And then finally, Amanda Gorman's words, be brave enough not just to see it. I think we all took that step of being brave enough to see it. We're here today. We're sharing today. But let's be brave enough to be it. So thank you for everyone that shared during the community comments. Our next speaker is a former Human Rights and Relations Commissioner, Dr. Ellen Kennedy, PhD, who was joining us this afternoon via WebEx. Dr. Kennedy founded the World Without Genocide to protect, prevent, prosecute, and remember. Under her leadership as Executive Director, World Without Genocide educates about past and current conflicts and advocates at local, state, and national levels for policy and legislation that promote peace and justice. Dr. Kennedy serves as an adjunct professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. She has been recognized locally and nationally for her work in education and human rights. It's so nice to have you joining us today, Ellen. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this important topic. I want to encourage everyone to be an upstander. If we could start the slides, please, that would be great. Slides. An upstander is a person who stands up, who speaks out, and who refuses to let injustice go on. A bystander knows that something bad is happening, but does nothing. Henry Ortelt, a blessed memory, a Holocaust survivor in our community, told me that a bystander is as responsible for evil as a perpetrator is. To stand by is to be complicit, to accept the morally unacceptable, to let innocent people become victims of hate. And I wanna talk about simple steps to be an upstander. First, a personal story. Slide. Are we able to see the slides? No, apparently. Hi, right, here we go. Next one, please. Next one. We see you, Jew. That was the subject line of this email that I received a while ago. And the message read, misusing the name Kennedy doesn't hide what you really are from everyone, Tuckner. Put on your yellow star. There was no signature and there was no traceable email address. The sender was anonymous and invisible. I was neither anonymous nor invisible. Slide. The sender threatened that I should wear a yellow star, like the Jews were forced to do during the Holocaust. I am a Jew. I wear a Jewish star around my neck every day. I identify with my Jewish heritage, the history, the culture, and the religion. I married a man named Kennedy, and I took his last name, which was typical at that time. My maiden name is Narotsky, not Tuckner. My grandparents came to the United States from Vilna, Lithuania in 1903, long before the Holocaust. My relatives who stayed behind in Europe were exterminated by the Nazis. I don't know why I received that message. Slide, please. Maybe it was because I had an article in that morning's Min Post newspaper excoriating neo-Nazism. And you see the headline here. And I wrote in that article, we must not tolerate the swastikas, racial epithets, and hateful messages that have appeared in Edina, Minneapolis, St. Cloud, St. Paul, and elsewhere. 
I live in Edina, where there have been at least eight incidents of swastikas and racial slurs painted in public spaces. Someone said to me, this is not who we really are. Unfortunately, it was becoming clear that this is who we really are, and we must change. We cannot wait another moment to speak up and the legacy of Auschwitz. That's what I wrote. Or maybe it was just part of today's climate in the US and I was a visible target. Next slide, please. A few days after I received that hate email, I wrote an article about it and about the scourge of neo-Nazism. I emailed it to the editor of the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Mike Burbach. I didn't know him, but I found his contact information online. And shortly after I hit send, my phone rang. And the caller said, Ellen, this is Mike Burbach at the Pioneer Press. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Those words were profoundly meaningful to me. He validated my hurt, my fear, and my human dignity. Just the same message that Nicole Jennings heard. I ask you to stand up and speak out when you witness acts or hear words of discrimination or hate, and to do this calmly and quietly and safely. Be a friend to the person or the family being treated without dignity and without respect and also report these incidents to the local police and to the Minneapolis FBI. I speak about these issues often. After a recent talk, a woman approached me. She said she didn't know what to do. A friend of hers makes negative remarks about Jews and other vulnerable groups in front of her. She stays quiet, but she feels very guilty letting these remarks go unchallenged. And I suggested that she say to the friend, again calmly and quietly, your words make me feel uncomfortable. Please don't say them in my presence. And that's all, it's a first step, it's simple. Make it about you, not about that person's beliefs. Don't argue, don't confront, but stand up. A few weeks ago, a member of the Aberdeen City Council who identifies as a transgender woman was publicly vilified with words of hate. I found her email address and I sent her a note. Slide, please. I praised her courage and I told her that our organization advocates for LGBTQ plus rights. And she wrote back and, and she said, thank you for your encouragement and words of support. These words are helping me and my family to get through this time. As well, many huge thanks and hugs, if allowed, to the World Without Genocide organization. It is comforting to know that we are not alone and that others are supporting us. Next slide. A mixed race family in Cold Spring, Minnesota endured months of racist incidents. Very recently, a white supremacist put a brick on the gas pedal of his SUV he jumped out of the car and he sent the car crashing into the house. You see this horrible picture endangering a sleeping child. I sent a note and again, the family indicated that hearing from people in the community gives them courage and gives them comfort. Next slide, please. So how do we get to this point? Slide. Thank you. This picture from the Holocaust era in Europe makes it clear. Jews were forced to scrub the streets on their hands and knees. Crowds are there watching, jeering, standing by. I've circled the most important onlookers, the children. This is what they're learning. The adults could have intervened. They could have joined in the scrubbing. They could have been upstanders, but they are bystanders. And the message to their children is that some people can be treated as less than human. In 1949, after World War II, a wonderful show opened on Broadway that is often performed today. The show, South Pacific, deals with racism and hate. Slide, please. 
The lyrics to one of the songs speak to us today and resonate to what some of the community members have said. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. Next slide, please. Sophie Scholl lived under the Nazi regime in Germany. She was part of a resistance group known as the White Rose. At age 21, she and her comrades were executed for their activities. Her words call us to stand up. My husband is an emeritus professor at a Minnesota university. He said that many years ago, a person in his department disparaged a South Asian colleague. My husband didn't know what to say, and he said nothing. He still feels the shame. So I say today, we cannot be bystanders. Words matter. Our words matter. Our actions matter. Next slide, please. Amidah is Hebrew for standing up. The word was used during the Holocaust to refer to people who stood up, who resisted injustice. Today, we must be upstanders. We must stand with, alongside, and for those who are marginalized based only on who they are. I ask all of us, teach your children to sit with the child who is alone at lunch include everyone on the playground during recess, and to welcome everyone into their friendship circles. We must all do this. The time is now. The time is always now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for joining us virtually and reminding us that Yes, indeed, our words and actions do matter. Finally, we are going to start to hear from Edina public officials about what our state, school district, and city are doing to combat and counter bias hate. First is Melissa Lopez Franzen, JD, Minnesota State Senator for District 49. Senator Lopez Franzen is serving her third consecutive term in the Minnesota Senate, representing Senate District 49, which includes Edina and parts of Bloomington, Eden Prairie, and Minnetonka. She is the co-founder and president of New Publica, a public relations and strategic communications firm. Senator Lopez Franzen serves on the board of the Nelio Foundation Fund in the Hispanic Scholarship Fund Advisory Council and is a member of the National Hispanic Caucus. Thank you. Should I adjust your mic for you? Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. If it was up to legislation to eliminate hate, uh, I think we have a lot of people that can do that in the legislature, or at least we attempt to, but it's not going to eliminate hate. Uh, I recall some of the comments earlier from uh, out front and James Carville, and I recall when I was elected in 2012, my first controversial bill, quite frankly, was the anti-bullying law uh, that passed to, uh, in 2014. It was called the Safe and Supportive Minnesota Schools Act, and it helped with uh, attacking cyberbullying, threat of bullying in schools, and it, it, it laid a pathwork of uh, model policy for students and, and schools to follow. And it was under the guise that all students deserve to attend school free of bullying, intimidation, and harassment. I wish we can pass a bill similarly for all of our communities, because that's what we should be living, a place uh, without intimidation, without bullying, and, and without hate. Uh, but we need more tools, uh, and I know that we've been working in our workplaces uh, to do implicit bias training, uh, and also to build transparency and trust in our communities. Uh, for instance, in law enforcement, as has been also mentioned with the recent events uh, here in Minnesota that uh, really uh, opened a, a conversation that needed to happen in our country about race and hate. 
Uh, here are several examples this past year in the Minnesota legislature, uh, and some of them have failed, but our attempts to deal with this issue of crimes motivated by bias. Uh, there was a bill uh, that was sponsored by a St. Louis Park uh, legislator, Senator Latz, a member of the Jewish community as well, Senate File 20. And it attempted to do three things. One was to close loopholes that misclassify hateful incidents. The second was to allow victims to report hate incidents to non-law enforcement entities like community organizations and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. And the third thing it attempted to do is to provide support for the victims of hate crimes. This bill did not pass. One, did, one resolution, Senate resolution, that did pass was Senate Resolution 48, uh, and it was sponsored on a bipartisan level by Senator Fung Her, among American here in Minnesota, uh, Jim Abler, a Republican, Hoffman, uh, a, a Democrat, Franz and myself, and Miller, a Republican. This did pass, and it was condemning acts of violence and racism and hate against Minnesotans of Asian descent, given the uptick in incidents across our country and our state. So when we decide to work together, we can do that, and we can do that across political spectrums. As you also have heard for uh, the issues of, uh, of hate and, and the issues of distrust in our community with law enforcement, we were tackled, tackling this issue uh, very heavily in the last year and a half. I do think they're relevant because we also, when we talk about hate, we also have to talk about how do we build trust and transparency in our community. And a few bills that I'll mention uh, real quick was uh, we made modifications to the post board, which is where we license our officers. And we do care, just as we uh, had an event yesterday that was spearheaded here in this community to honor uh, those first responders that are present and have worked really hard in our community. We also have to rebuild the trust and we have to build trust in ourselves and our neighbors and our community. Uh, we created a more effective early warning intervention systems for law enforcement to better ensure that those sworn to serve in their communities are doing so and building trans trust again and transparency. One other piece that I think is important that has to do with acceptance and, and also um, moving forward in, in how we use our first responders in our community, how we trust them to help us because they're there to serve. Uh, Senate filed 1924 and it passed in the Senate Travis Law, uh, another bipartisan bill here. We're requiring 911 operators to refer calls involving mental health crisis to mental health crisis teams when appropriate. I know that Hennepin County is doing a much better job do at that, and we're really spearheading those efforts to, again, uh, have the help that people need to move forward. Other researchers from the state, I know they are in your agenda, but I do want to mention that the Department of Human Rights has a discrimination helpline for reporting hate crimes, and this is new. This is in the last uh, year that this um, helpline came to be, and the number is 1-833-454-0148. It's open Monday through Friday from 8 o'clock in the morning to 4.30 p.m. They also can do a report, you can do a report online under report discrimination, uh, but the, the helpline is a something new that was also funded to support communities who are experiencing hate in their environments and their community. Again, the number is 1-833-454-0148. I recently saw a documentary about the Israeli and Palestinian peace negotiations. So when Steve Hunnix was talking about um, how we're still, and so does Ellen Kennedy, about uh, the Jewish experience, uh, this, in this documentary was called The Human Factor. And I found uh, very interesting, they were talking about the negotiation between both um, sides. And one of the negotiators stated at the end of the documentary that unless we are willing to accept the other side, there is zero chance for a solution. And I interpret that, uh, as you may as well, or perhaps differently, that you don't always have to agree but do you do have to accept each other and respect each other? And as a mentor of mine would say, you can disagree without being disagreeable. He actually also emailed me this week uh, giving some words of encouragement, and I love unsolicited advice and encouragement, so please send the positive emails our way. Uh, politicians usually um, are not used to that. <laughs> he also said in his email, that he hoped that we can refocus on a mindset of curiosity, 
optimism, and the ability to see one, an one another beyond our labels. Not just our political labels, but in the many other ways we combine and separate ourselves in our society. And I agree wholeheartedly with him. I'll end with a short personal note. Uh, my oldest is a sixth grade, uh, six year old, excuse me, uh, first grader. And this week, and it's happened a few days, he's shared with me several times that his schoolmates have called him small. And he wasn't happy about that. I responded, well, first of it triggered my mind, but I responded with him, well, you may be small, but tell them you're wicked fast. He said, they already know that. <sighs> our children are watching us. And if all they hear is our deficiencies and our differences, rather than our strengths, it will take generations to make the change that we need to, in our community. And it starts with us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Franzen, for reminding us to lead and lean into our strengths. Next, we will hear from Representative Heather Elderson, uh, Minnesota State Representative for District 49A, my district. Representative Elderson has been serving Edina in the Minnesota House of Representatives since 2019. She is Assistant Majority Leader with the House DFL Caucus and serves on four legislative committees, including public safety and criminal justice reform. Representative Elderson. Oh, don't touch it, don't touch it, uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm already breaking the rules. Well, hello everybody. My name's Heather Edelson. I am a proud resident of Edina. I'm very proud and honored to represent our city at the Capitol with Senator Franzen. Not great to go after you, you're a great speaker. Uh, so, um, I, I just, I want to acknowledge a few of the community comments, um, but I want to thank the Human Rights Commission for hosting this today. I was once a member of the Human Rights Commission and the work you do is incredibly important. Um, so, I read a comment at one point that said, hate is bias that has gone unchecked. Hate is bias that has gone unchecked. So it made me think of, of something when I had a colleague from the Capitol come and speak to Edina Rotarians, uh, Judge Small. I think he has kids that live in the community actually. Uh, and he said, um, if you see something, say something. And we were talking about morals and values and if you see something, say something. And oftentimes we might see something but not say something because it doesn't impact us. We make a lot of assumptions about people and I think uh, somebody could look at, I mean, Nicole, I, I, I really appreciate what you had said. Um, who are, I guess, who are we? Who are we as Edina residents? I want to say to Fartoon, you are home in Edina. This is your country. I want to say to Brian, your identity cannot be hidden, but we are proud of you and your skin is beautiful. I see your skin. You do not have to hide it. Uh, the Edina uh, Cultural Club uh, students, thank you for being here and speaking up. To Ukasha, I am genuinely sorry that happened to your wife. I don't see where he is. Uh, and then V Nam, I have heard of Edina Truth. Somebody alerted me to it. It has been um, sobering to see, especially some of the sexual assaults that our, our students are experiencing at the high school. I'm not gonna talk a great deal about the legislation because Senator Franzen already did. We do have uh, Edina hate crime, or sorry, uh, hate crime legislation that we're working on, unfortunately, and it's due to no fault of your Senator Franzen. The Senate has not uh, wanted to pick that up. We have uh, had a hard time having those conversations about passing legislation um, dealing directly with bias. Uh, but I would just say this, as, as a mother of, of a child with disabilities, as somebody that grew up in North Minneapolis in a black community where I was literally only white kid in my class, we see color, we see disabilities. You do not have to hide if you're GLBTQ. We need to figure out how to lean into the discomfort. 
We truly do. And we need to make space for people. This week, I, I have a story about my children too. Um, I have a son that has a physical disability. Um, his leg is a great deal shorter. He lost half of his foot. Um, and a, a kid said to him, he has, you have a disability. And Caleb, my son said, wait, what? He didn't even, he had no idea. So he came home and we're sitting at the table and he said, mom, I have a serious thing we need to talk about. And I was like, well, what's this? Oh, goodness. It's the first week of middle school. And he said, this kid said, I have a disability. I don't have a disability. And so it was interesting to me because I thought about this. Who defines who we are? I've never talked about Caleb having a disability because he has so many abilities. And I want to focus on those things. And so we have to have conversations about asking questions and being open about that. Just today at the Crime Fund booth, and I see our, our police chief is here, um, uh, another little kid asked my son, what happened to your leg? And I thought that was so great. What happened to your leg? Could you imagine if somebody just asked a simple question? Why do you wear a scarf on your head? I bet you probably wouldn't be so offended. You would say, oh, you're genuinely curious. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you my culture. Um, we just, I am Jewish. I just, uh, rep or we just uh, celebrated Rosh Hashanah and we have the, the 10 days till Yom Kippur are happening. And it makes me think uh, during these times, how can we be better as a people? And I guess my words to you are, if you see something, say something. Thank you. Thank you for that, Representative Elderson. I had the honor of fishing with your boys this summer <laughs> in one of our local community parks, and I will tell you, they are very competitive to be loving brothers. Um, and I, I think what you said about who defines you is so important, and I think that's the opportunity that we have as community members. We get to define our community for what we want it to be known for. We don't always have to be called the cake eaters or every day I need attention. There's so much good in Edina, so we can define Edina and what it stands for and what it represents and what it offers to our great state. Next, we have Dr. Stacy Stanley, the new superintendent of Edina Public Schools. Dr. Stanley began her career in education as a teacher in the East Metro Integration District and then as an elementary school principal in Roseville in the Burnsville Egan Savage School District. Dr. Stanley served first as Director of Equity and Integrated Support Services then as Director of Curriculum, Assessment, Instruction, and Support Services. Most recently, Dr. Stanley served as Associate Superintendent at Eden Prairie Public Schools. And Dr. Stanley also participated in an initiative I founded in response to George Floyd's murder, uh, Share the Mic Minnesota, and she participated with one of our own Edina's um, residents, uh, Roshini. I always butcher her last name, so I'm not even gonna say that, but everybody knows Roshini, so thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Stanley. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, can you, Jasmine, can you lift the microphone up, up for me, please? Thank you. No. Roshini Rajkumar. Rajkumar. Oh, my God, is she an amazing human being or what? That was a fantastic experience to be chosen for Share the Mic. Share the Mic is an organization that really seeks to lift up the voices of uh, women of color, and I was really honored to be involved with that. Good afternoon, everybody. It is fantastic to see uh, so many of you here. Thank you to Jasmine. Thank you to Joni. Thank you to uh, the Human Rights and Relations Commission for inviting me to join you this afternoon. So when I was asked several weeks ago to speak about the vision of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in Edina schools, I was in the early stages uh, really assessing who we are our culture, and our hopes and desires for an environment of inclusion. Our vision in Edina Public Schools is that each and every student would discover their possibilities and thrive. 
Now, those of you who are social scientists know that Dr. Abraham Maslow helped us as educators really to understand that regardless of age, individuals cannot thrive unless and until they have a sense of love and belonging. So that is the goal and foundation of our future diversity, equity, and inclusion work in Edina Public Schools. To the students who spoke, I'm sorry. Simply put, I'm sorry that you experienced that. To the families who spoke, I'm sorry. That is not something that I would want or expect under my leadership. A key aspect of our work is to understand our history. In the Ghanaian language, there is a word called Sankofa. Sankofa implores us to understand and harness all of our past in an effort to know where we are heading. And we do have a rich past in Edina indeed. Now, I created a handout, and hopefully everybody was able to get one, but it is a handout that has pictures of individuals, uh, African Americans from, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. I know that there were a few, and if you don't have one, um, perhaps you could look on with your neighbor, because it is going to be important for you to have the visual of what I am talking about. So during the initial weeks of my tenure, I learned about the rich racial diversity that Edina represented early in its history. The Yancey family, who now have a park named after them that will be dedicated on October 4th, came to this area post-Civil War to restart their lives. They began farming near Edina Mills, now 50th and Minnehaha Creek, creating a rich and profound presence within what would become the Edina community. Like many of our current dedicated families, Mrs. Ellen Maria Yancey wanted the best for our schools and founded Edina's first PTA and was its first president. And her husband, Beverly Claiborne Yancey, was one of many who led the efforts for Edina to succeed from the Richfield Township and incorporate as an independent village in 1888. Their son, Charles C.B. Yancey, served on the Edina School Board. He was also the village clerk. The Yancey family was so committed and so connected to their community, our community that they donated the land for the Grange Hall to be relocated to where it stands today at Wilson and Eden. The handout includes a picture from circa 1900 where Madeline Gillespie, if you have it in front of you, she's noted as number two in the top row, and Ellen Gillespie, noted as number 21 in the bottom row, and Ernestine Siggers, noted as number 23 in the bottom row, sat and learned right alongside of their European American peers and were simply referred to in the history annals as scholars. That is a word that we use in education for our students all the time today. Learning this, I was left wondering how to move back to what we once had. And more importantly, if this was even known 
by our current community members. So, as Edina Public Schools moves forward with the next generation of our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, we will value and lean on our rich history and backgrounds that each and every one of us bring to our district. We will lean on the rich history of the Yanceys, the Gillespies, the Siggers, and the many others that helped to found and build Edina. I've learned that we don't have to reimagine what Edina could be like to stop the hate. Instead, in the spirit of Sankofa, we just need to understand and harness our history harness our history to move forward. Our work is an inside out approach requiring that we begin to deeply understand our own personal values, our own personal beliefs, the assumptions that we hold and more importantly, we need to be clear about how our personal values, beliefs, and assumptions impact our policies, how they impact our instructional practices, how they impact our service to each and every student so that they don't have to take on a name that their parents did not give them. And most importantly, how our values, our beliefs, and assumptions impact our vision for each and every student to discover their possibilities and thrive. So in closing, I am honored to lead this journey, this journey of self-awareness, this journey of institutional awareness, this journey of inclusion, and overall, a journey of action so that we can set the standard in Edina Public Schools where everybody's coming to us saying, how did you do that? How did you move from that environment where people were ashamed to say that they live in Edina? where people were fearful as a person of color of moving to Edina, to being that community that set the standard of inclusion in school systems. I gotta tell you, I was really excited to learn about HRRC because I fundamentally know it takes a village. It takes a village to create systems change and I really appreciate the community partnership, and I'm glad to invite you on the journey with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stanley. I think, you know, we definitely want our scholars to discover the possibilities and thrive, but we want all of our residents, and we want the people not only that reside in Edina, but we always think of the people that live in Edina, that play in Edina, and that work in Edina. We want everyone to be able to discover their possibilities and thrive. Our last speaker today is James B. Hovland, JD, Mayor of the City of Edina. Edina. Mayor Hoblin has served Edina since 1997, first as a city council member for eight years and as mayor since 2005, a leader in regional transportation and for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Mayor Hoblin also serves on the board of the Edina Community Foundation as co-chair of the Regional Council of Mayors and as chair of the Municipal Legislative Commission. He is a partner in the law firm, Hovlin and Rasmus. Thank you. Are you Thank okay you. with the microphone? Good. You, want it, you want it up or you good? good? Okay. okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for including me in this conversation. Uh, I've been around so long, I was thinking about uh, when I first got on the city council, 
uh, and we had uh, the Human Rights and Relations Commission, and I recall that Edina is one of the first cities in the metropolitan area to have a Human Rights and Relations Commission. This has always been important work in the city of Edina, being more inclusive, uh, being more accepting of other people, trying to figure out how we're going to all get along together in this world that's becoming ever more diverse. The next thing I thought about as I was sitting listening to speakers was what happened back in 2016, in October of 2016, as some of the people were talking about some of the incidents that they'd experienced in our community that are more recent in nature. It caused me to think about the incident in October of 16 when one of our police lieutenants stopped a young black man who was walking down the middle of Xerxes Avenue named Larney Thomas. And he didn't have any handcuffs with him, and it was it was post it was post the period when there was Ferguson, and there was Baltimore, and there was Baton Rouge, and there was Dallas, and the whole country was sensitized by the interrelationships between police and and African American young men in particular. Nobody got physically hurt. But there was film footage that did not look good, did not look appropriate. And we filled this chambers in our last meeting in October with folks from the uh, African-American community. I think they spoke for three hours about injustice that they felt that they were facing all through the metropolitan area. It was one speaker after another telling compelling stories. But that wasn't at the end for me. This is the, actually the first opportunity we think about this, in, this, this event today of Stop the Hate, this is the first chance that I have had to tell people in a group setting about the calls that I got after that incident. I got calls from all over the United States, but I got a lot of calls from people in Edina. And I bet I was getting four to five calls a day about experiences that people had had in the past and probably over a 20, 30 period of year period of time with the Edina police. I had a I had an actual retired policeman call me and the language that was so vile, it was unbelievable, about letting those people into our chambers. And I was so appreciative of the fact that he was long gone, <laughs> long gone. And I can tell you that the officers we have today are so good and are so professional and are so cautious and careful about how they interact with people no matter what their color. We're really, we're really proud of the police force that we have here and I think they know that we, we support them. And we have a new chief who's sitting out uh, in the audience, Todd Milburn, uh, been here only a few weeks and has had to face all kinds of difficulties with the, particularly with the, with the uh, tragic death of a young Somali American girl, a little two and a half year old girl uh, over at Rosin Park just a few days ago. It was, a, it was a tough week, tough week for everybody involved. But the community, I think, uh, to Ukasha's comment, was, has been so supportive. And you can see it really in the, uh, in the GoFundMe page, where people came out and tried to help find the little girl. Now they're trying to provide financial support for the family, and it's a fantastic thing. Edina is changing and it's changing for the better, but these things, it doesn't move as fast as you want and people's behavior, that learned behavior that people are talking about here today uh, is, is something that takes time to, to, to overcome and to teach people how to, how to behave and act uh, appropriately with each other. Um, we, we had an event yesterday and someone mentioned that I think uh, down in Utley Park uh, a celebration, not a celebration, but a recognition of the anniversary of 9-11. And, you know, in that, in that moment when we were talking down there about what was going on 20 years ago, and we were talking about in times of crisis, there's opportunity. And in that situation, there was opportunity for the creation of a sense of common purpose, building a sense of patriotism, the desire to rally to defeat an enemy which has wronged us and some of our people. But in times of crisis, 
we got to also be aware of the fact that there's also opportunity to exploit the differences between us and to engage in conduct and encourage people to engage in conduct that's detrimental to all of us. Crisis can create the need to find a scapegoat. And we've seen it so many times in our history to exploit hatred and bias. Denying Jewish people safe harbor in the 30s as they wandered the globe looking for a safe place to live. Interring our Japanese neighbors after Pearl Harbor. Japanese Americans interred in California and elsewhere. Attacking Muslim Americans or their places of worship after 9-11. And as Dr. Decker mentioned, attacking our Asian American neighbors blamed for what's been called by some the China virus. So we need to be vigilant against this bias that can become hatred, that can build among some of us. And we know in the times that we're facing now, we've got to be ever vigilant to all of this and try to push it back, hold it back, push it out of the way. Don't let it be part of any of our lives. And the question we need to be asking ourselves is, what do we want to be as a people? How should we and how will we treat each other? Those are the important questions, those fundamental questions. The things you learned in, in kindergarten, the golden rule, treating others as you'd like to be treated yourself. And what in the world does it have to do with anybody's skin color? What in the world does it have to do with that? In this world that's getting ever more diverse, Last Tuesday, the, the day after the young little girl died, I spent that morning over at the command center. I was thinking about the way I started my day uh, as an illustration of how the world is becoming more diverse and we're all so much richer and better off for it. It wasn't a great way to start the day, but at the command center, I was able to meet his, her mother and her friends and be able to have a conversation with them to tell them how much their, the city that they lived in cared about them and worried about their family. I went back to my office and met a fellow that lives in Edina here, a friend of ours who serves in one of our commissions. He happens to be from West Africa. And I was able to take him over to a bank because he's got a great idea for a business going. And I was able to introduce him to a banker. Then I went to a mayor meeting at noon, four white old white guys, and two uh, women, uh, and then as I was coming out of the restaurant, I had a guy holler at me that I turned around and recognized as one of my colleagues from the TAB, the Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council, an African-American lives in North Minneapolis. He didn't need dine having lunch. Had a great conversation with him. And so it went during the day, just this interaction with people, all kinds of different people, all for the enrichment of me as a person, making me a better person in the process. So let's, let's, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but yesterday morning, if any of you watched that ceremony from uh, the, the memorial, uh, the 9-11 memorial in Washington, or in, in New York, excuse me, you heard uh, a beautiful song. Um, and of course, um, it was, you'll never walk alone. And part of the lyric is, uh, walk on with love and hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. Well, shouldn't we all be thinking about that here today? Let's all walk together. Let's all partner up and walk together with love and hope in our hearts, and we'll never walk alone. Now, I've got some housekeeping to do here as well. Uh, Joanie Bennett has asked me to remind everybody to please mark your calendars for two upcoming Human Rights and Relations Commission events. Sunday, October 17th from 3 to 5, the HRRC will be hosting a fully virtual community conversation on race, justice, and policing. That's on October 17th from 3 to 5, so watch for further announcements on that. It'll be live streamed on Edina TV, Facebook, and the City of Edina website and recorded for rebroadcast. And then also this fall, this is an award that's been going on for quite a while, the Tom Oy Award uh, uh, that is um, a, function of the HRRC. The award honors, honors the late Tom Oy and others from our community who work to advance human rights and promote strong human relations. 
And you can find more information about the Tom Oy uh, process and the award on the City of Edina website. And then, of course, Dr. Stanley has mentioned something that's really important that's coming up on October 4th, which is the dedication, the rededication of Garden Park as Yancey Park. And that is something we ought to all be really very, very excited about. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event um, to recognize those founders, uh, that founding, one of the founding families of Edina. So Ellen Kennedy, too, has asked me to, uh, to comment. And I want to thank everybody that participated today and came today. And she just wants to remind all of us to continue to think about being an upstander not a bystander. And so when you think, see things going on, don't be afraid to step in. Don't be afraid to express your voice. We'll try to do it as a community and we should be trying to do it individually as well. Thank you all for coming today. It was a terrific event. Hovland, and thank you everyone for joining us. You took my last line. See, that was I was going to share the call to action that we should all try to speak up and do something when we see and hear things. Let's not be a bystander, but let's be an upstander. And please join us on October 4th for the Yancey Park dedication. Um, join us for the second event on October 17th, and then make sure you nominate people in our community doing impactful human rights work for the Tom Oy Award. It's always a wonderful event. Um, the award is presented uh, at a city council meeting. And so we want to have lots of nominations this year. And remember that this is our community. It is our community. So we have a lot of, a lot of skin in the game. We had a lot of skin in the game to make sure that Edina is a place where all people feel appreciated, safe, respected and where all people can thrive. Here's to being an upstander. Thank you.